Our last speaker is Dr. Anthony Pilney, who is a terrific exotics vet from New York. He is an associate at the um, clinic we have for exotic mammals in New York. He's been doing exotic mammals for quite a number of years after graduating from the University of Florida. He is also now the medical director for the International House Rabbit Society. So he's, you've heard of him, you have. <laughs> now you've heard of him too. <laughs> So he's our current medical director. We've had a series of wonderful vets as medical director. Um, most recently, right before Anthony, was Susan Brown. Uh, anyway, he's going to talk to us this afternoon for the next 45 minutes. If everybody can get down and get settled, he'll have more time to talk, and uh, we'll get more accomplished. Thank you so much. It is my pleasure to be here. I really appreciate the opportunity to present to you today. Lucky that I'm the one who gets to kind of bring down the house at the end of this amazing conference. I did just want to send out a and commend all the people who put this conference together. I know it's a lot of work to do this, and it's a lot of effort that people put into them. So a round of applause for all of the people that worked so hard to make sure this happened for us. I would love it if this was something that could become a regular event. I know that there are exorbitant costs involved, but if there was a way that we could create an annual educators conference that was along the lines of what we had this weekend, I think that would be really beneficial and I think it would be a great way for us to continue doing what we're doing here. Um, and on that note, I did want to mention that throughout my talk, which I will stick with our time limit, um, Almost all the other speakers that you've heard through this weekend have touched on something that I'm going to touch on during this lecture. And interestingly, this is a clinical lecture on dental disease in rabbits, but it's a bit more encompassing than that. There's a lot more that we need to be able to think outside of the mouth and think outside of the teeth. And the majority of other presenters have touched on some of the really interesting points and some topics. And I think that's kind of a metaphor for what we're doing here, this dissemination of information, the, the education, the, the ability for us to be in a position where we can teach other people, veterinarians who want to learn about rabbits, technicians who need training. Um, like Mary Cotter, I also teach in a veterinary technology program, which I've been doing for about six years. And it's been a great opportunity for me to reach out to those people that won't get what I teach any other way. So I think that's really important. So this lecture is on dental disease in rabbits, and it's maybe preaching to the choir to some of you, because if you own rabbits or foster or work with rabbits, you've dealt with some form of dental disease. I think it's impossible to, to get around that. And we deal with these a lot clinically in practice, um, and they sometimes are a bit challenging. Part of that is because we need to think of these as a dental syndrome. We've historically thought of these as dental problems, tooth root abscesses, tooth infections, without thinking of the whole patient, the whole mouth, the whole animal. There's a wide variety of clinical presentations that we see when these animals develop dental problems. But the exact cause of a lot of these problems, in other words, the exact <laughs> etiology, is what we still haven't definitively figured out. Regardless of that, we know there's two main goals, return of anatomy and function, and control of inflammation and infection. And those are the main points of what we're doing in the majority of our dental patients. We do have to look at the possibility of underlying causes and underlying disease in these patients. We're not only dealing with disease of one tooth in a lot of cases. Sometimes we have patients that are presenting to us with disease of the incisors. We sometimes have disease of cheek teeth, the premolars and molars, or we have a combination thereof, and sometimes they're related to each other. And these are the important aspects that we look at. And in almost every situation, we really need to be addressing the nutrition. We need to be looking at what may be leading to abnormal or uneven wear of these teeth that may be the predisposing factor to the development of dental disease. The reason I titled this slide like a cancer was a number of years ago when I was in veterinary school. And then progressing through into my residency, I had the opportunity to work with a lot of great surgeons. Um, Avery Bennett, who you heard speak a little bit earlier, was one of my professors in veterinary school, actually. And I had the opportunity to learn a lot of surgery from him. But even through my residency, when I first started learning about the approach to dealing with dental disease and dental abscesses, they were often using this terminology that these diseases were almost like a cancer. And that's more in their behavior. They're difficult to treat. A lot of them tended to be recurrent. They weren't a quick fix. 
A lot of them required long-term therapy. A lot of them recurred long after you thought you had sufficiently or definitively treated that patient. And I think that's where that terminology really fits when we're dealing with this subset of syndromes and diseases in our pet rabbits. When we're looking about at our options of what we're going to do, medical management versus surgical management, of course, will depend on the type of dental condition that's diagnosed. Like I said, there generally isn't a quick fix in most cases, and a lot of times we need to continue to think outside the box. So a few facts that we know about dealing with dental disease in rabbits, um, we're dealing with one of a number of conditions. Genetic basis, traumatic injuries, or more commonly, lack of normal wear and alterations with the physical teeth themselves. We know that an unnatural or inappropriate diet is certainly not going to provide enough usable fiber. It's going to alter the way that rabbit chews the food they eat and it's not going to allow them to compensate for the continued tooth growth. So we need to make sure that these animals are fed properly enough that they're able to wear their teeth. We know that if they're wearing unevenly because they're chewing the wrong foods, too much of those foods that don't have them chew with the normal rabbit pattern, they're going to result in points and spurs and sharp edges on these teeth because of abnormal wear. We also need to consider that there may be eye or ocular presentations of dental disease. And we don't want to just focus solely on the eye. We want to make sure we realize that some of these may be related to dental conditions. Early changes that we see in some of these patients may be corrected with a proper dietary change. Now we know we deal with a lot of these patients in rescues and, and in some ways we have to get them on a proper diet as soon as possible. In many cases when you start sort of profiling why that animal may have been left at a shelter, there's a chance it may not have been receiving adequate care to begin with. That may be an animal that has never eaten hay. That may be the patient that we're dealing with that has never been on a proper diet, or they were told by the pet store employee that that, that you know, mucilage mix that we, we see with the seeds and the corn and, and the, the different types of oats is a proper and complete diet, and that's all that rabbits need. So. I think we know enough that we've gotten away from that and I think we've advanced enough in rabbit nutrition where we're able to work with this, but it's not always what we're dealing with. So I want to touch on this topic as well. Dr. Smith had, had brought this up and I believe others had mentioned as well. Um, one of the possible underlying causes that has been proposed with some of these rabbits does relate to, and we use the generic term, metabolic bone disease. Some of this information was, was thought through and started as a thesis and has gone into some publication um, through Francis Harcourt Brown and looking at the possibility of alterations of calcium metabolism as a predisposing cause for dental disease. Basically what we're looking at is, is if that animal is resorbing calcium from the bone and they're breaking down that bone, it's going to lead to loosening of those teeth as those teeth shift in position results in deformities, it results in malocclusion, those teeth no longer line up. And now they have a situation developing where abnormal position of those teeth has now resulted from resorption of the bone around those teeth and may not be primarily related to a dental condition. Now we have all different types of dental diseases that develop secondarily to that. Um, I think that there is probably more that needs to be looked into, it's a common adage in, in all research that further studies are needed and a lot of times we need to look further into some of these topics but this may be sort of a larger area that we may have, have underappreciated over the years in looking at why some rabbits are developing dental disease. You may find a repeat of a few pictures from some lectures that have passed as well. Um, one of the important concepts that we know in feeding rabbits as well is that grasses and a lot of these fibrous plants contain large numbers of phytoliths. These phytoliths are basically these abrasive substances which help wear the teeth. Phytoliths may be largely absent from overly clean hays. They're more of, of a, something that we know that rabbits in the wild are getting enough of and are contributing to tooth wear. There are people who theorize that overly clean haze and um, overly processed foods, and, and when we're dealing with, with grasses in particular, we may not have enough of these to help wear the teeth as well, and that may be a problem in dealing with, with these, these rabbits developing dental diseases. So definitely we need to maintain that chewing efficiency. 
we need to make sure that we're aware that lost tooth is constantly being replaced and those teeth grow throughout the entire life of the rabbit. I don't want to spend much time on this because this is sort of the, the verbal description of uh, Dr. Cole's $1,400 movie that he was able to show. <laughs> I um, didn't have $1,400 for a movie, so I typed this for free. But this basically summarizes everything he was talking about. You know, rabbits are able to digest cellulose. They have enzymes that can break down certain food substances that mammalian enzymes cannot. So rabbits, we know as unique animals, have some unique attributes. Um, you know, they bite and they shred and they process these foods, and then they have to work their way down to that hind gut for fermentation. And, and like I said, we've been through that. Um, I think that's an important concept. And, and those of us that are working with rabbits and seeing them a lot, um, everyone in this room included, we need to always make sure we have a good handle on anatomy and physiology. We need to understand what's going on inside of that rabbit. A little bit of terminology, and, and part of this as well, is, is, is just semantics, but I think it's important that we know some of these fancy terms. Um, they help make us look smarter, and I think they help also raise that level of, of our education on what we're dealing with. The dental formula in rabbits, adult rabbits have 28 teeth. I know that's something that amazes a lot of new clients or a lot of new rabbit owners. They think that rabbits only have those four, even though they know, we know they have six. They think the rabbit's the only teeth are those four that they've ever seen in the front. They forget there's a lot more teeth in that rabbit's mouth. Um, 16 deciduous teeth, um, which are replaced, and then 28 permanent teeth in the adult rabbit. The incisors and cheek teeth in rabbits are called aerodacular hypsodont teeth. And the eelodont dentition, the terminology, basically describes teeth that grow or erupt continuously throughout life. Generally, we're going to hold this balance by proper wear. It's sort of like a, a well-working machine. They're wearing these teeth down at a rate that goes along with how quickly these teeth are growing. That's what allows for a normal dentition. The cheek teeth include premolars and molars. They do not have canine teeth, so they have a diphodont dentition. That basically describes what we've already said, that they have deciduous teeth, which then result in 28 permanent adult teeth. Rabbits also have a fairly loose temporomandibular joint. This allows the jaw to move side to side and front to back, but they don't have a lot of up and down motion. And really that's important when we look at the, the physics of how rabbits chew and eat the proper foods and how improper foods cause them to chew in very different ways that then lead to different patterns of tooth wear. They have fairly small oral cavities. A lot of that is because they have very well-developed masseter muscles that help them chew. And they have a long diastema, and that's basically that space between the front incisors and then the first premolar. So there's that area where we typically think other animals would have those canine teeth. The lower jaw is narrower than the upper jaw. That's called anisonathism, and that's just a term that describes the anatomy of how the lower jaw is thinner in rabbits. What's important clinically, though, in moving into that, is how a lot of these features can make it a little bit difficult to really view those teeth. We've heard other speakers talk about doing oral examinations when it's come up and the importance in some cases of sedated oral exams. Um, we often have to rely on skull radiography or CAT scans or other imaging techniques, but we also have to do what's important, and that's the step before all that, is get our visual oral exam and make sure that we're looking at the, the patient's teeth before we rely on advanced imaging. Um, normal dentition here, showing the rabbit's skull. A lot of you have seen these. A number of different drawings as well. Um, here as well, in comparison to Dr. Bennett's expensive drawing, if you trace it, it's free. <laughs> so you can show your, you can, you can make your own images that maybe aren't as fancy, but they're a lot less expensive, and I think they're equally as effective. And it's more just to show the position of these teeth. Remember, rabbits have these so-called peg teeth, or they have those um, additional incisors that are behind the upper front incisors, as well as the remaining premolars and molars. So where does the problem start, and what leads into the concerns we have in dealing with these patients? Well, I've already mentioned, and we already know, that rabbits have continuously growing teeth. Studies have shown that they grow between 1 and 5 millimeters a week, depending on age, depending on where, depending on the diet that they're on. We know that the, the cheek teeth that are in the back, in the back of the mouth, erupt 
generally 10 to 20 millimeters per month. So they have to be fed so that they can wear that much down as those teeth continue to grow. The upper incisors grow about two millimeters per week, which is slower than the lower incisors. We know that normal dentition should, in, should be that the lower incisors rest behind the upper incisors when the rabbit's mouth is closed. Dental growth, of course, influenced by age, by health, by gender, nutrition, and trying to find that balance between tooth eruption and wear is really important, and that's why we have a lot of these diagrams where we look at how we're feeding them. Certainly, the bulk of the diet needs to be grass hay. I think we've know, we know that. Um, we've evolved enough to know that we've improved our, our pelleted diets. We know that we need to keep low sugar, low carb type of food in the diet. Um, as a clinical veterinarian, I deal with a lot of rabbits that eat a lot of junk food. It's not uncommon for them to, and we know they like them, but potato chips and pretzels and, and almonds and nuts and crackers and um, certain patients. I have a, a radiograph coming up that's pretty dramatic of a rabbit that ate Cheerios its whole life, and you'll see what that does in the mouth. So. We have a problem. We're dealing with dental disease. These rabbits are presenting with any number of different clinical signs. Some of those that we see that owners don't appreciate soon enough may be selective eating. Well, it looks like they're still eating. They're still finding droppings in the litter box. It seems like maybe they're a little bit smaller, but there's enough of them and they tend not to be as worried. Excessive salivation, sometimes they don't notice that that quickly. Sometimes the rabbits are constantly wiping and grooming and cleaning their face, and they don't appreciate how wet the chin can become. And then nasal discharge and eye discharge, not directly related to the mouth, not directly um, what people think might indicate there's a tooth problem, but they need to be explored fully when we're dealing with the rabbit, especially if we see eye discharge, and especially when we're dealing with any number of these different dental diseases. And I don't need to read this list to you. You have the notes there. Um, but all of these have been identified as possible diagnoses of dental diseases. And you can see there's quite a lot of them. Um, certainly some of them occur more commonly than others. We know that demographically we see certain problems. I don't know if that relates to breeding in that area or which pet stores source from which breeders and, and whether that relates to a genetic underlying current in some of these. But we have this long list and we deal with these and the most important thing we're ever going to do for these patients is get a definitive diagnosis figuring out what the exact dental condition is, is going to allow us to take the proper steps to treat it, to prevent it, and hopefully cure it if it's possible. So we know the causes of dental disease can be varied. We know that diet is a huge one. I think I've said that several times. I think we've heard a lot of others mention that as well. We know that as we've evolved our knowledge of rabbits and as we've evolved more of how we think we need to feed them, and that may still have a little bit of tweaking as we, as we move on, but we know that diet's vitally important, and we know that's been a, a mistake. I mean, it was mentioned earlier when Dr. Coles had talked about rabbits historically had lived in a hutch in the backyard. Rabbits were historically for food or for fur. Rabbits that were used in biomedical research were maintained on a pelleted diet. They, they lived and they survived just fine on pellets alone because that met their nutritional needs in most cases for the short amount of time that they needed to survive. So a lot of that is what filtered into the mainstream way that we cared for rabbits. And the important part is, is evolving public perception and public thinking. And then while I'm on that as well, I think a big part of that is, is continued work with pet stores. I personally feel like that's a, a, a large place where there's, there's a bit of a failure in, in pet care in general. Um, no offense to pet stores or anybody that sponsors the conference, but um, in dealing with a lot, of, a lot of conditions, we know that there's a, a lot of fault lying with some of these pet stores, and it's, it'd be nice to, to try to figure a way to work with that. So we're making a diagnosis. We're looking at our physical exam findings. The rabbit comes in with any varying amounts of clinical signs. The owner has a perception something is wrong. First thing we're going to do is look in the mouth. I mean, we should be doing oral exams in all rabbits, whether they come in for a dental problem or not. That's a standard part of the, the, the rabbit's physical exam. If they're not having problems as part of the physical exam, I wouldn't say that it means that they should be sedated or anesthetized for an oral exam um, unless you can't get a look in that mouth at all, and we think we need to do that. Um, sedation may or may not be needed. This is something that comes up, and it's probably of varied opinions. 
there are some people like myself in, in calm rabbits that are comfortable being restrained for a few minutes that allow us to get a good exam, I often feel like you can get a decent enough evaluation of whether you need to move further into sedation or anesthesia to work forward with that patient. Um, sometimes um, direct exam is not possible. The rabbit may be chewing or struggling or just won't tolerate having any device put in their mouth. We may need to consider how we can get a better look. Imaging findings, certainly x-rays with our multiple views. Dr. Bennett, I think, said he likes four views. Some people prefer even up to six. Um, we're looking at oblique views so that when we have actual radiographs to look at, we can see all of the teeth without them being superimposed over each other. And then CAT scan certainly has revolutionized veterinary medicine. I think the ability for CAT scan to be more available, I think with the price of CAT scans coming down, we're finding that they are extremely valuable. And I've had a number of rabbit patients, dental disease and otherwise, where they would not have been diagnosed without a CAT scan. I think there was probably going to be no way we would have definitively figured out what was wrong. Um, short of the necropsy, which I'd rather not make a diagnosis that way, but we rely on CAT scan and it's really changed what we can do and it's really helped a lot with our diagnosis of dental disease and, and evaluation of those teeth and tooth roots. Um, the point here on fine needle aspirin is certainly related to abscesses. It's easy enough when an, a rabbit presents with a jaw swelling. If it looks like an abscess and it, it, it appears that way, it probably is, but a simple needle aspirate to find out that that abscess is, is, or that growth is full of pus will at least allow us to move in the right direction and it's a fairly quick and easy thing we can do. Like I mentioned, the direct exam, I think most people use these, these specula. They are widely available. I think Welch Allen still sells them and they can be ordered. Anybody working with rabbits will use them. And they're used in the sedated rabbit as well, in the anesthetized patient. But they're also used in the awake patient to get a general visual look inside the mouth. Uh, if you've never used them, what's nice is they have a valve that can separate the tissue so you can push the cheek out and you can isolate that dental arcade between the, the parts of the, the bivalve there and it allows you to get an assessment of those teeth. Of course, it's really important and something that we all need to know is when you do an oral exam, you're looking at the teeth from the gums up. You have no idea at that point what's going on below the gums, the teeth, tooth roots, um, and anything else that may be affected. So all you can see is if there's a clue or an indication, there may be further dental disease that then requires further medical workup. So our oral exam that we do, um, one of two ways, direct exam, like I showed in the last, and sometimes endoscopic exams. And, and along the lines of what Dr. Bennett was talking about, intubating rabbits, some people using an endoscope, um, some people using the otoscope, and a number of different ways that you can do that. We can use those same instruments if we have them as an opportunity to get a look in the rabbit's mouth. These are nice as well because in, in, if you have the otoscope or the endoscope at your discretion to use, you can put it in there and very quickly get a full oral assessment like you can see in the image here, actually in both of these images, but you can see that you can get pictures, you can get images, you can store those in a patient file, and you can get a full assessment of, of how terrible the teeth can actually be and what you need to do. It allows me to explain this to a, a client and it also allows the client to have a better understanding because they never see what's going on in their rabbit's mouth. So if you can get pictures or if you can show them, share x-rays, have them understand and look at what's going on. I very commonly will take my normal x-rays to show them so we can say this is what a normal rabbit looks like. I think even if you've never looked at an x-ray, at least you can see what abnormal is when we show that visually. But if we have the ability to do these endoscopic oral exams, they take only a couple minutes. It's an easy way to get a full assessment of the teeth above the gum line and also a method to identify certain problems. You can see in the lower image over here where those teeth have just worn so incorrectly that it's going to lead to, to bigger problems. And at least it shows somebody what needs to be corrected moving forward. A point on nasolacrimal duct obstructions. This is a common problem that we see. A portion of these or a percentage of these rabbits do present with nasolacrimal duct problems or obstructions that could in some cases relate to tooth root elongation and dental disease. Um, 
I don't tend to see that a lot, but some of these patients that have recurrent problems with obstructions, some of these rabbits that are coming in to have these ducts flushed or being taught how to do it themselves, or some of those that come in and they're, they're through a rescue and a foster brings them in and we cannot flush it, sometimes it's ideal to x-ray them and just make sure, at least be able to easily rule out the involvement of the possibility of tooth root disease or dental disease or some other problem that's leading to obstruction of those nasal acromal ducts. So the first condition that we deal with a lot, um, going through the ones that are more common, are going to be our incisor malocclusions. Now these can be congenital or acquired. Congenital is a hereditary or they're born with them. Um, there are um, a lot of instances where these rabbits come in and they're presenting because they haven't been eating. Nobody didn't even notice that the teeth are this way because sometimes they overgrow into the oral cavity. I've seen some of these where the incisors will grow in and they manage fortunately to curl around and they'll actually curl inside the oral cavity and if you just take a quick glance or, or pet owners that don't have a good handle on being able to look at the front of the rabbit's mouth, they miss these. Um, certainly once they're up into the nose or they're growing out this severely, it's hard to miss. I have had patients come in with a present, uh, presenting complaint that they're not grooming themselves. They're not cleaning themselves. They're looking a bit unkempt. And sometimes we can look to the teeth for that problem as well. Um, certainly rabbits that aren't taking care of themselves or aren't grooming or aren't able to, there's a long list of potential problems, but the teeth is an easy one to look at. And I have some rabbits that owners have decided to come in for regular trimming of these front incisor teeth rather than remove them. And oftentimes those rabbits come in and they start looking a little unkempt and scruffy, get the teeth done, they can go back to taking care of themselves. And sometimes that's an indication of when the teeth need to be trimmed. We're always faced with the decision, do you trim these for life or do we take those teeth out? I know that we have reached a point where when we're working with our rescues and we're looking towards ways that we can improve adoption, we all know it's a little bit difficult to adopt a problem. We have a little bit of a hesitation when we do that. So I know that those of us in New York now have really evolved when these rabbits are, are, are dumped or left at the shelter, we strongly consider just taking those teeth out right from the start. Um, it's, a, it's been a, a bit more successful in getting those rabbits placed. Um, people who have them um, often have the choice to decide, I think is probably the, the preferred method of, of dealing with these and treating them long term. What does work really well in those rabbits that are not patient, um, are not surgical candidates that are not going to have those teeth taken out are these diamond disc blades. They're very inexpensive. I know, I think people can even buy them on Amazon and some other places. Um, they are cleanable. It's very rapid, very precise. Some rabbits get so used to it that they're calm enough that this can be done awake. These diamond disc blades that are put on a simple Dremel will saw through those teeth in two or three seconds. And if the rabbit is, is, is calm enough and restrained well enough, um, we can certainly do that. What's important is if we get a rabbit that's young enough and we can get these teeth trimmed frequently, there have been a small number of cases where we can actually reset that bite. We can actually get those teeth trimmed short enough and keep them trimmed short enough. This is a committed person that's willing to bring them in frequently to keep those teeth really, really short so we can see if we can get a shift in that mouth and a shift in that jaw where we can actually reset them and maybe in some of these cases actually not need to move forward. When we're dealing with what we call points and spurs, we've got those sharp edges on those teeth. They're not wearing normally. Um, it's important that we get used to looking at the rabbit's mouth and we make sure that we're really diagnosing these as opposed to just angles of the teeth. Uneven wear that keeps those teeth worn may have the general appearance, but it's more of an angulation and less of an actual spur. So it's important that you see enough teeth to recognize the difference between those. What we generally are looking at here are those razor sharp ridges and, and sometimes you see terrible lacerations of the tongue, sometimes you see terrible cuts along the cheeks. Once they have those, they often aren't willing to chew as well because chewing becomes very painful. And so we have to get the cause out of there. We have to get those points off. It may be as simple and, in, and there are those patients that have one. For whatever reason, there's one tooth in that mouth that just seems to grow unevenly. Maybe it's, it's shifted in its, its socket in a sense, and it needs to just be trimmed and that rabbit goes off food and it comes in and gets that one tooth trimmed and they go back to eating for a month or two. 
So it may be as simple as being able to even those out. It may be as complicated as needing a full dentistry. Patients sedated with us actually going in there and getting all those teeth burred down. The other big one that we deal with and, and probably one of the biggest headaches are our, our dental abscesses, our dental root, tooth root, or these abscesses and pockets of infection that develop as a result of dental disease and then everything that comes after that. Infection that's been sitting there, the potential for osteomyelitis and bone infection, the definitive ability to determine the tooth or teeth that may be playing a role in this. One of the important things we have to consider is when do we and how do we start treating these patients. Sometimes the best clinical decision is to get them started on antibiotics and do nothing else. Give those antibiotics a little bit of time to start working. Um, we do know that there is some, some debate about that in the sense that rabbits are really good about walling these off. Rabbits are really great about putting those layers of that, that capsule around these. They're trying to deal with the infection on their own. There may be some limitation to how well antibiotics are really ever going to penetrate that. And until we have some degree of surgical manipulation, we may not be doing much. But there are some who think that starting antibiotics um, pre-surgically and getting those on board for a few days um, actually make a difference. And there have been a number of patients that we've actually seen some of these abscesses shrink down. So we at least want to believe that there may be some response to systemic antibiotic therapy. In most cases, we're looking at some form of surgery. I think most people realize that dental abscesses are going to require that. And then we have to always be prepared for the potential of recurrence. Despite our most aggressive and best efforts, it's possible that some of these come back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he is actually still going strong. Oh, great. He has had, oh gosh, it's been probably almost eight years since we took him in like that. And he's had um, the abscess on the jaw worked on probably three times over the years. Lots of ablation, lots of teeth removed. But I'll tell you what, he's still going strong. Great. Um, great. Now he's, he's a good success story. Excellent. Yeah. And I forgot to mention if there are questions or comments or thoughts or corrections even, please feel free to, to add those to the discussion. Um, and thanks for that information. That's great to know. Um, this is a radiograph, and this is a rabbit I was talking about that had been on a diet of Cheerios. So um, we can appreciate that every single thing that could be wrong is. I mean, this is a condition where there's so much badness going on here, and this represents along the lines of not only dental disease in every tooth, incisor malocclusion, um, abnormalities in tooth, huge pockets around those teeth, uh, shifting of teeth, uneven wear. You know, we're dealing with a lot of problems here, but we also have some metabolic bone disease. We've got a loss of that sort of opacity of that skull. You can also see this enormously huge abscess that's hanging down here. So not only do we have the abscess formation and soft tissue, we have erosion of the skull, erosion of the bone, large alveolar space around these teeth. Um, this rabbit needs an extensive amount of dental work. And, and some of these radiographs, you know, we just take these x-rays and you look at them and then you suddenly see everything more than you've seen in that mouth. Maybe you've appreciated some loose teeth, some unevenness. Maybe you've even seen those dead teeth. They're black or brown or discolored and we know something's wrong. But it's not until you get these images um, that you really start seeing a lot. And of course, a case like this, if we had done a CAT scan, I guess if we felt like we needed it, I think we get enough answers here. But if we had done that, those would be pretty dramatic images as well. And sometimes it's, it's interesting to see those because it tends to lend to our appreciation of how severe some of this dental disease really is. Um, one of the things that we should never underestimate, dental disease, any condition, we've heard about it a lot. Um, analgesia, pain control, pain medication is really, really important. We've heard a little bit of the, the then and now discussion and, and what used to be and some of our standards of care and how they've changed, how this organization has been responsible for changing some of those. But let's not, you know, sort of underestimate or undervalue how painful some of these conditions may actually be. When we're looking at medical management and we're looking at antibiotic therapy, um, you know, any one of these dental diseases could be the topic of a lecture on its own. And any one of these treatment methods, when it comes up, probably could also be an entire lecture on its own. But just to cover some of the basic points, um, antibiotic therapy, 
pain medications, assisted feedings, uh, fluid therapy, hydration, all of those that we've heard about in other, other segments of other discussions um, are really important in working forward with getting these patients well, leading up to you know, direct treatment of the teeth, removal of loose teeth, um, scraping and, and sometimes removing infected bone and correcting those, those dental problems as we see them. We need to institute all these measures to try to give these patients the best chance. When we're getting into you know, more aggressive or full-on dental procedures, um, oftentimes this is what's required, sedation or anesthesia in these patients, getting them set up on, on a dental rack, additional lighting, anesthesia. It's an opportunity to hold that mouth open. There are a number of different instruments that have been developed. Dr. Bennett showed and, and mentioned that. A number of different devices that we've been able to, to learn from a lot of the dental work that's been done in England that has been very successful, as well as the development of, of cheek dilators and, and instruments that hold the tongue out of the way and, and getting all this hardware and all these mechanics in there, but it gives you the opportunity to really get a good evaluation and be able to get in that small oral cavity and make the corrections we need to make. The sooner we get those corrected, the sooner this animal is likely to go back to eating. The sooner they are going to recover, the less likely they are to develop complications from this. Dental rack, dental instruments, all of the equipment that we use are vitally important in making these patients well. You can see here an instance in, in some of the more severe cases, and you know, you all know as well as I do, some of these rabbits come in they're left at the shelter, we know nothing about them. We know nothing at that point that they've come in other than you look in there and you shriek a little bit and you see, well, we've got a lot to do here and a lot of corrections to make. It's no wonder this animal's not eating. It's very possible it was left at the shelter because it's not been eating, or it's possible that they run out of funds to take care of the previous dental work that's been done, and sometimes that's their only solution. But we need to facilitate the ability to do this. We need to know what we're doing, understanding the anatomy. A lot of what we've talked about leading up to this is what's really important and be able to make sure that we do all the corrections and get everything taken care of. As far as surgical management, we know that rabbit abscesses are different than when we consider other mammalian abscesses. That concept of the, the lance flush and drain is largely ineffective. On rare occasions, I would say that you know, we're used to rabbit pus being that cottage cheese, thick toothpaste, gross kind of consistency. Um, I've seen a few cases where it's been liquid, where it's almost like what you think you'd expect to see in like a cat bite abscess. I don't know what's going on there because they're not supposed to make that kind of pus, but I guess it's contingent on the infection there. Um, but we know that we're looking at what Dr. Bennett alluded to, capsulectomy, capsule debridement basically surgically removing as much disease as we can. We want to try to dissect that abscess away if we can. We often have to go through the abscess. Sometimes you're really lucky. You can actually open that abscess, cut away the majority of the capsule surrounding it, and you go through the center of that abscess and you find the tooth or teeth that are incriminating that problem. It's nice when you can do that. Then you can remove that tooth through that same surgery site. Sometimes these are our sort of simpler cases that we always hope for. Um, probably the minority of the time, but it allows us to also evaluate the surrounding bone, the surrounding area, extract any teeth that we need to take out at that time. There's a number of different techniques that we work with in trying to either keep these open. If you're using those antibiotic beads that Dr. Bennett talked about and we're placing those in a surgery site, we're leaving those in there so that they can leach out antibiotics for a period of time. We have those in there. We can close that surgery site completely, just like you think with other surgery sites. We don't have to leave it open. A lot of times we will, what's shown in this image is marsupialization. This is creating an opening, attaching that to the skin, and, and creating a surgical area where um, it prevents it from closing over. We know that a lot of times one of the problems with dealing with abscesses and rabbits as well is we need to keep them open. They're open to be flushed, they're open to be cleaned. We keep them open so that we can get in there and clean them out. They will heal over quickly. They'll have enough discharge, enough fluid, enough gook coming out of them that'll actually result in a problem where it closes over and it kind of recreates another abscess. Of course, there is a theory um, on what happens if you leave these, if we pay attention to them, but we leave them. Those instances where surgery, for whatever reason, has not been an option. Uh, combination of infection and gravity, a lot of these will open on their own. 
I've heard a lot of people who have not been able to to seek out veterinary care for this who have left these these abscesses will open rupture drain um, in some instances they'll heal even without any care um, I'm not saying that I would advocate that as a, a you know, the first line of treatment, but sometimes that's a, a realistic thing that comes up. And if we can manage those patients and treat them otherwise and keep them pain free while we let nature take its course to some degree, that may be largely effective in some of these instances. But I think in the majority of cases, we're really looking at surgical management in some level of the majority of these dental diseases and these abscesses. And some of the abscesses we see that come in that are just horrific. I mean, when you're, when you're having to go in there and surgery is a nightmare and things are growing around vital structures and, and you're dissecting through this patient in the neck and there are very important blood vessels in that area, um, we're dealing with some horrible conditions. Um, patients like this come in and they have no other option. You're not helping this animal if they can't go to surgery. One of the most important things that we can do in a lot of cases is not rush them right into the OR. We have to make sure that we've evaluated this patient completely. When it's possible, of course, sometimes in rescue, funding is an important aspect. Sometimes we're thinking along the lines of how do we put the most bang for our buck and help this patient. But in other instances, skipping blood tests, skipping x-rays, not evaluating that patient might be a bigger mistake in some cases. And if we're looking at going in for a, you know, what we sometimes call a project, we really need to make sure we're doing the right thing. It would be a shame to take this rabbit to surgery knowing it has, you know, one of the more horrific cases of abscesses only to put it under anesthesia and not have known that this patient had, had some, you know, kidney compromise or that this patient had a thymoma, you know, or something like that. And we were attributing everything to what we can visually see. So it's along the lines of more of that whole patient. Pre-surgical evaluation was covered already, um, making sure that we run what we need to to make sure that we're going to have the most successful outcome in dealing with a surgical patient. And I put horrible on here because I think you know this, this one stands out as really one of the worst cases. I mean, by the time you've done three separate surgeries and you've taken out you know three to four capsulated abscesses in each site, and you're, you know, you're putting a lot of effort and time into it, they tend to be really difficult. Of course, if, if we can get the patient treated and get all of this taken care of, um, they also tend to be a bit more rewarding. In working through surgery and actually getting through the, the abscess areas, this is an example of going through. What you can see here is a hole made in the abscess. A large amount of the capsule that surrounds that infection has been cut away. We're looking in there at bone. We can start you know, examining through that site for teeth, tooth roots, and what we need to do to further deal with this problem. Now, I've said it, I think, four times, but surgery really becomes a, the biggest way that we're going to get through dealing with and curing and treating a lot of these patients. You've heard this mentioned several times. Um, I think that's actually a really important part of, of what we're doing here. And I think, as I mentioned earlier, so many other speakers that have been here this weekend have, have alluded to a lot of the same concepts that keep coming up, um, which I think is really an interesting aspect in what we're doing. It's, it's a big part of that sort of sharing of information. And when we look at what works and what doesn't, I as well consider culture and sensitivity very important in the management of a lot of these patients. I think it's very, very, very important now because in my neck of the woods, we're starting to see a lot of penicillin resistance. Um, a lot of you probably know that when we realized that penicillin was this miracle cure for these abscesses, that we could suddenly start using penicillin in rabbits. Um, we don't ever use oral penicillins, beta-lactamase antibiotics. But when we realized that injectable penicillin was safe and these rabbits were tolerating it, um, I think it became maybe too popular. And we started forgetting about other antibiotic therapy, and we started realizing that you know, it was OK to just start them on the penicillin their rescues and there wasn't money in the budget to culture every patient, we had to go with what we wanted. And I think largely um, we know that veterinary medicine in general has a role in antibiotic resistance. That's something that we've had to pay attention to. I think we've learned through our, our, our management of farm animals and food animals and our production as well as medicated feed that we've played a role in that. And we've reached a point now where antibiotic resistance is a serious concern. Somebody had mentioned MRSA in a, in a previous question. Um, MRSA, in my opinion, is becoming a bigger problem, especially because I'm diagnosing it in wildlife. 
and I think that's something that we hoped wasn't going to happen. But these patterns of antibiotic resistance are important for us to follow trends with. Along the lines of the penicillin, we've talked a lot about Batril and Rofloxacin. Batril used to be the exotic pet antibiotic. Every sick exotic pet, rabbit or otherwise, was put on Batril when they needed an antibiotic. And over the years, we've learned that there are a lot of other options, and sometimes performing culture and sensitivity testing is an important way to choose the right antibiotics. It's also a good way to make sure that the antibiotics that the rabbit has not been on are not the wrong ones. If we wonder why it's not healing and why that infection is not going away, if we've skipped culture and sensitivity testing, the important thing is to remember a couple of things. One is never do our cultures when that animal is on antibiotics. So it does necessitate stopping antibiotic therapy. Um, there's a little bit of debate amongst the microbiologists at least three days, sometimes five days would probably be better. There's the potential to get false negative results. So if that animal has had culture testing and has either been on antibiotics or has been on them too recently, there may be the possibility that the lab doesn't culture anything, even though you've sent them obvious infection, and a big part of that reason may relate to um, antibiotic interference. So we have to pay attention to that. Um, the second thing that's really important is making sure we culture the right thing. Culturing pus, pus is just dead cells. Um, maybe contain some bacteria, but it's not the most effective um, part of an abscess to culture. It's really ideal to get tissue, to get capsule, to get the lining of that capsule, to really get a better specimen. When I open an abscess and I'm doing capsulectomy anyway, and we're cutting away and dissecting it out, I'm going to submit parts of that capsule. Rather than just submit that pus and that discharge, it's very possible that pus alone is not the most ideal sample for culture and sensitivity testing. We've also um, discussed a little bit about anaerobic bacteria. There are some challenges in culturing anaerobic bacteria. There are some challenges in treating those and whether they play a big role in some of these abscesses and infections. Certain antibiotics that don't cover them as opposed to some antibiotics that may cover some anaerobic infections. So we have to consider the population of bacteria, but I find that culture and sensitivity testing um, is going to help steer us in the right direction, and it does definitely help steer us away from the wrong way. So it remains a, a pretty important um, test or an important modality in dealing with this whole entire scope of dental diseases that we see in rabbits. So. In conclusion, you know, we see a variety of different dental diseases in rabbits. We'd like to think a lot of these are preventable. You know, we're still at a place where acquired dental disease, improper feeding, I mentioned a rabbit that was eating a diet of Cheerios and we saw what that would do. We still run into situations where, well, they won't eat hay so they stop feeding it and now it's come back and it's two years later and now the teeth have, have um, punished us for that. We still, still deal with um, client education and the information that they have. We deal with conflicting information online and making sure that we get people to know where they can find the reputable information, try to steer them to rabbit.org, but sometimes they've read something else and they've got that information from someplace else. Um, we have the development of new diets. I think that's really important. We have these companies that are, are out here that were, were kind enough to join this conference and they, they have their their products and we're seeing the development of newer and improved and better diets. Of course we're seeing different recipes and that lends into a little bit of controversy but that's another can of worms. But basically we're looking at different diets that are probably more appropriate as time goes on. Let's think about a rapid diagnosis. How do we get that? How are we figuring out what's wrong with these patients and how are we treating them? Whether we need to go as far as advanced imaging. Is the CAT scan going to be the best way to figure out everything that's wrong? In a lot of cases, it probably is. In a lot of cases, it's going to give us a lot of useful information. Can every rabbit have a CAT scan? No. So sometimes we're dealing with plain x-rays, and sometimes we're dealing with what we see visually. What I often tell, especially clients, is, is we're going to invest a lot of time in home care. We have to think about supportive feedings. We have to think about long-term pain control, antibiotic therapy. Um, with that, of course, comes the next one, a lot of money. These can be quite costly when we're dealing with recurrence, when we're dealing with chronic dental disease. So that's another part of it. Um, and the last part, of course, is, is not to be afraid of second opinions. And I think this is something that's really important in veterinary medicine. Um, if you are not happy or things don't sound right or 
before you go with aggressive measures, just like we do with ourselves when we have second opinions, there's nothing wrong with doing that. And if there's a veterinarian that has an, takes offense at that, then I think there's a bigger problem. I mean, I'm, I'm all for that. I would be happy for anybody that, that took my advice and opinions and wanted to see what somebody else thought. I'm happy to send x-rays and blood tests and, and notes and all of that. So don't be afraid and don't overlook the potential for other sort of rabbit savvy veterinarians to be able to, to give you a second opinion on what you're dealing with. Um, a lot of you have probably seen this poster, the rabbit dental anatomy. It hangs in probably most every veterinary hospital that sees and treats rabbits. Um, it is available, it's a good resource, it's a lot of interesting information. Um, I like to keep one hanging because of clients and the ability to point and show them what we're dealing with in a lot of instances. Um, and it hangs in a lot of, like I said, veterinary practices. So, that's what I have for you. If there are questions, I'm happy to take them. Mm -hmm. Yes? All of those, yeah. <laughs> I, I think what we're looking at, what we're looking at in almost all these instances, in, in, and of course it, it sounds overly simplistic, a lot of times it's what works for that rabbit, of course. Um, we know that there are some rabbits who are sensitive to certain foods, and whether it's dealing with how we're managing the teeth, you know, a hundred rabbits are fine on kale, but that hundred and first rabbit for some reason can't deal with it. You know, we all deal with those instances. Um, when we're looking at that, a lot of this is subjective, and a lot of these, the food pyramid that we have here at HRS, um, any of the other images that we've had, I think have tried to drive home the importance of, of grass hay. And I think that's what we want people to realize. So look at those and know, no matter how you draw that picture, no matter what shape the diagram is, let's really keep a focus on the grass hay. Let's keep a focus on, you know, not getting into the debate of whether you believe in pellets or not. Pellets are the smallest part of the diet for supplemental vitamins and nutrients, and then we're filling in there with fresh foods, um, depending on what they are and, and how they work out as treats. People have advocated measures. You've heard, you've heard people say, you know, a cup per pound per day when it's chopped. We've heard people who talk about figuring out what size salad works for that rabbit. So I don't think that there's an exact answer because there's no exact measure that works for everybody. I think the importance is making sure we look at percentages of the diet and we follow through with it that way. You had mentioned a problem with overly clean hay. Are you talking about the later cuttings, or is this something else? I think it just relates to the concept of, of grass and the presence of those silicates that are present. Think about them along the lines of dirt and other substances that are in the soil that rabbits who are eating outside, wild rabbits, they're taking in a lot of these abrasive substances that may not be on manufactured hay or may not be in those levels. So the rabbit that's picking up roots, that's eating grass down to the ground, that may take in some, some more dirt and they may have more of these, these abrasive substances. It's almost like if you think about sand. Sometimes you eat a salad and you didn't wash the lettuce as well and you crunch on a little bit of something. Those type of things that are present in wild rabbit diets may be somewhat of a loss in some of our produced hay. I think it's, 
two answers to that. Um, one of those, well, right off the bat, yes, I think. I think that one of the things that we're always looking for as veterinarians is newer and better testing. It's along the lines of how we've evolved over the years, um, even through the advent of PCR testing. I mean, PCR testing has, has absolutely changed everything we do, and especially with other animals, PCR testing for virus, infectious diseases, and all that. Um, so along the lines as we start doing that, and then we've seen improvement in PCR testing, and we've seen development of that. So advanced diagnostic testing that becomes affordable, that, that is, is priced, that's not something that we think of as, oh, they do that in the research lab, we can't do that clinically. Um, I think it's definitely there. And, and one example of that is, is some of the, the research animal labs that we've worked with to do some of the testing that we couldn't do otherwise. Um, one example is, is, is the, um, the, the panels for pet rats for mycoplasma testing. They haven't largely been offered through anybody except contacting a biomedical research lab and saying, how much are you going to charge us if I have just a couple of clients a month? And sometimes you can work that out. So I think that um, all of those, if they came to be used, if people understood what the benefit of them and the value was, um, I definitely think there's a place for those. I definitely think we're going to look for you to make that happen. So you, you need to be writing this up and you need to be putting these ideas out there and, and making sure that people are aware of these type of things because we, especially in, in clinical practice, we need to know what's available and what's different. And a lot of times that's not going to happen if we don't talk about it here. And it takes a larger scale than here as well. But if you have the, the desire to, to see those things happen, um, you, the individual, can make that happen. Start writing it up. Start publishing. Start putting that information. Partner yourself with people that want to do that. You know, if you have the data, partner yourself with veterinarians that are willing to do it, even if it's on a smaller scale. Even if it's just presenting it at conferences, it gets the ideas out there. I think that's the importance. I mean, the, the theory is they lack these certain proteolytic enzymes that certain reptiles lack that are what make pus liquid. There are certain enzymes that are involved in how that happens. Um, the theory used to be that it was just a chronicity, that it turned to cottage cheese because it had been there so long, or that because it was so well encapsulated, the rabbit's immune system walled it off so well that that altered you know, oxygen, and th there, there have been so many thoughts with it. But that's an interesting observation that you witnessed that and then saw it turn that quickly. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. Those are so nice. And it's nice because that does happen sometimes. That's part of the problem because the diagnostic labs now <laughs> will will take a, a single sample, a sterile swab that's put in the media and send that and then that's sent for both aerobic and anaerobic from the same sample. And I think that's been part of the problem. A number of years ago, um, we used to have a separate vial with a separate media with, that had that, that ground beef looking material. And that was supposedly the way. And those have kind of disappeared because the labs are telling us they can do anaerobic cultures through that single specimen. Um, and I think that's, that's sort of been a limiting factor with it. I think it's been complicated. And I think so many of the things, even just this one point that we've mentioned and, and, and what, what she had said, are the things that are so largely overlooked in medicine, largely overlooked in veterinary medicine. And then, you know, we go through and we send a sample and we get a report and we read it and the lab said, 
they cultured this anaerobe or there were no anaerobes cultured and, and what do you do with that information? You know, how do you, how do you really get that patient well if we can't trust the labs? And I think that's part of the problem. Mm -hmm. Stop. <laughs> Thank you.